Davy O'Shea works as a sparker for Nikola Tesla, implementing his wireless electricity technology to the streets of London in 1888. He's also on the lookout as a detective for Scotland Yard, during the peak of Jack the Ripper's gruesome spree. Visited by a strange man one night out on the job, Davy is presented with the legendary sword Excalibur, and upon touching it, learns he is a descendant of King Arthur himself. Now armed with the knowledge of his famed ancestor, Davy joins forces with other descendants of the Round Table to search for King Arthur's true nemesis. Always two steps behind, however, and with more of the Ripper's victims piling up, Davy must find a way to get ahead in order to stop both past and present adversaries. Lamplight is the first ever Keeper's novel created by A. David Barrett. You can find it now on Amazon, on Kindle, hardcover and paperback, and also soon in audiobook format, narrated by the fantastic, if I may say so, Matt Taylor, aka me. So, Check out Lamplight using the link in the description box. It's an incredible read and a very, very good listen too. Greetings to those who watch below. Before we start today's video, I'd like to let you know that Lamplight is now officially live on Audible and Amazon as an audiobook. So please make sure to check it out using the link in the description. Also, you can find the link to join those who dwell below, an exclusive channel membership that gets you shoutouts at the start of every video, just like this. Thank you to Steffi Ray, Lefty Kim, M.A. Way, Julie B, Chris BLK Chris, Tegan S, Tasos Karamaris, LT Punisher 666, Wicked Witch, Lisa Watts, and Christina Groves. Also, if you enjoy the channel, please make sure to subscribe, hitting the notification bell so that you never miss a video. Before we start today's video, I'd like to let you all know that it contains graphic descriptions of serial killings. So, if you would be upset by this, please turn off the video. So now, sit back, relax and enjoy these four unidentified serial killers. The Saw Killer of Hanover The Saw Killer of Hanover is the name of an unidentified German serial killer who was supposedly responsible for murdering and dismembering at least four women and two men, whose body parts were found in Hanover and the surrounding area in the 1970s. None of the victims have been identified, and the case is also referred to as the Found Corpses of Hanover. The Soko Torso Unit of the Hanoverian Police, directed by Commissioner Gunter Nauetus, investigated the murders at the time. A total of 13 body parts were found in the years from 1975 to 1977. On September 26, 1975, the first corpse was found at the hydroelectric power plant near Mash. The torso of a young woman was found by a worker, the breasts of the deceased were severed and the abdomen cleared. The body had probably been in the water for about 10 to 14 days. The woman was about 23 to 25 years old. She had a scar on her abdomen and had given birth to at least one child. The body had been tied together with a decoration cord. The special commission designated the corpse as torso number one. It was probably cut with either a saw circular or band, or a surgical instrument, used to sever the torso from the woman's arms and legs. Despite having the fingerprints examined, authorities could not identify the victim. In the period from February 21st to the 28th, 1976, two upper halves of a body and the leg of a woman aged 25 years old were found. The time of death had to have occurred two to three weeks before finding the body parts. The two halves of the chest were later discovered between parked cars at a Hanoverian Broadcasting Centre. The other leg was found in a dumpster by students of the local girls' school in the street Bonnestraub. 
other body parts were found floating in the River Lianne. In the period from May 28th to June 11th, 1977, six body parts from a young man were found at the hydroelectric power plant, always on the weekends. The victim was estimated to be 17 to 18 years old, and about 170 centimetres tall. He also had an iron cross tattooed on his upper body. On June 5th, the arm of an approximately 50-year-old man was found again at the power plant. On July 10th, the body of a woman was discovered by a person walking along the Island Ride Forest. The victim was at least 40 years old, wore a shoe size of five and a half, had an appendectomy scar, had given birth to at least one child, and suffered from atherosclerosis. The lower body had been severed with a machine saw. The fines from 1977 assured the coroners that the victims had suffered violence before being murdered. On December 18th, the last corpse from the series was discovered on a dirt road near Hanover. The upper body of a 50 to 60 year old woman was found wrapped up in an old cotton blanket, had strangulation marks on the neck, and both her arms and legs had been cut off. The woman was between 160 to 170 centimetres tall, had also had an appendectomy and given birth to at least one child. An autopsy revealed that her death was caused by suffocation. The common pattern for all the corpses is that for most of the victims, the cause of death could not be determined. They had only been dead for a short time before discovery, and were cut up with a saw or surgical instrument. The whereabouts of the rest of the bodies remain unknown. The body parts were always disposed of on Saturdays in conspicuous places, so that they could be found by passers-by. According to Chief Detective Nowatus, who investigated the case, the police had no crime scene, no time in the crime, and neither the perpetrator's nor the victim's identity. And once the 11 individual body parts were assigned to the six victims, the situation complicated further. According to Soko Torso, the offender did not have profound anatomical knowledge, with the cuts being made at the joints, suggesting it might be the work of a butcher. It is striking that the perpetrators had no aspirations to hide the body parts of the victims, but even had a certain exhibitionist tendency, as they were dumped within two kilometres of the city near Mash. He dumped them not too far from where the police headquarters of Hanover were located. The main obstacle to the investigation was the fact that none of the victims' identities were discovered. According to Nowatus, the offender would otherwise have barely a chance to remain undetected. The perpetrator-victim relationships remained unknown. Investigations in local morgues, surveys of undertakers, and the systematic comparison of missing persons didn't uncover any clues. No missing person could fit with the body parts discovered. One possible motive could be the intention to put the inhabitants of Hanover into a panic. The criminologist Stefan Habor suspected that this person was a highly pathological perpetrator. Police suspected that the perpetrator was on weekday employment and had to store the bodies cool in the meantime, and then transport them on the weekend by car and leave them in conspicuous places where there was much traffic. The case gained popularity after being broadcast on German TV, with a very strong interest and cooperative participation from the audience. The fact that the murders ended abruptly in 1977 meant that the culprit had probably moved area, was jailed at a correctional facility for another offence, or had died. The West Mesa Murders the West Mesa murders are the killings of 11 women whose remains were found buried in 2009 in the desert on the West Mesa of Albuquerque, New Mexico. Several suspects have been named, but none have been arrested or charged. Between 2001 and 2005, 11 women were buried by an unknown assailant in an Arroyo Bank on Albuquerque's West Mesa, in an undeveloped area within city limits. Satellite imagery taken between 2003 and 2005 shows tire marks and patches of disturbed soil in the area where the remains were recovered. 
By 2006, development had encroached on the area, and soon after, the site was disturbed, buried, and platted for residential development. Due to the 2008 housing bubble collapse, development on the west side halted before housing could be built at the burial site. After neighbours complained of flooding at the platted site due to the burial of the natural arroyo, the developer built a retaining wall to channel stormwater to a retention pond built in the approximate area of the burial site, inadvertently exposing bones to the surface. On the 2nd of February 2009, a woman walking a dog found a human bone on the West Mesa and reported it to police. As a result of the subsequent police investigation, authorities discovered the remains of 11 women and girls and a fetus buried in the area. They were between 15 and 32 years of age, most were mestizos, and most were involved in drugs and sex work. The remains discovered in 2009 were identified as those of the following women and girls, all of whom disappeared between 2001 and 2005. They were Jamie Barella, Monica Candelaria, Victoria Chavez, Virginia Cloven, Solania Edwards, Cinnamon Alks, Doreen Marquez, Julie Nieto, Veronica Romero, Evelyn Salazar, and Michelle Valdez. According to satellite photos, the last victim was buried in 2005. Solania Edwards, a 15-year-old runaway from Lawton, Oklahoma, was the only African-American person and the only victim from out of state. Michelle Valdez was four months pregnant at the time of her death. On December 9, 2010, Albuquerque police released six photos of seven other unidentified women who may also be linked to West Mesa. Police would not say how or where they had obtained the photos. Some of the women appear to be unconscious, and many share the same physical characteristics as the original 11 victims. The following day, police released an additional photograph of another woman. This woman was identified by family members who reported that she had died of natural causes several years earlier. On 13th of December, police reported that two of the women in the photos had been identified as alive and could have valuable information if they can be located. In June 2018, more bones were found near the site of the burials, but these were later determined to be ancient and not related to the West Mesa murders. Police suspect that the bodies were all buried by the same person or persons and may be the work of a serial killer, who has since come to be referred to as the West Mesa Bone Collector. No official suspects have ever been named in connection with the murders. In 2010, a reward of up to $100,000 was being offered for information leading to the arrest and conviction of the person or persons responsible. Over time, a number of men have attracted police attention, though they have not been named as full suspects in connection with the murders. Fred Reynolds was a pimp who knew one of the missing women and reportedly had photos of missing sex workers. He died of natural causes in January 2009. Lorenzo Montoya lived less than three miles from the burial site. In 2006, there were reportedly dirt trails leading from his trailer park to the site. In December of 2006, Montoya strangled a teenager at his trailer and was then shot to death by the teen's boyfriend. It would appear the killing stopped after his death. In August 2010, police served several properties in Joplin, Missouri associated with local photographer and businessman Ron Irwin in connection with the West Mesa cases. They confiscated tens of thousands of photos from the man, who reportedly used to visit the state fair in Albuquerque. Police confirmed that they had cleared Irwin as a suspect. Finally, in December 2010, convicted Colorado serial killer Scott Lee Kimball stated that he was being investigated for the West Mesa murders, but he denied killing the women. The Tailor of Chalon 
The year was 1598, and the town of Chalon, in the Champagne region of France, began to fall under the spell of fear when children began to go missing at an unusual rate. The strange thing about this case, compared to the others on this video, is that the killer was actually caught, tried, and executed. However, due to the court destroying all records of the case, we no longer know his name, only his grisly crimes. At first, it seemed that these children were just vanishing off the face of the earth, but then the disappearances were cast into a grim new light when there were reports of a bestial creature, half animal and half man, prowling the surrounding wilderness. Considering that this was an era in which myths, witches and monsters were very much considered to be a real threat, it was not long before rumours began to spread that the town was being besieged by a werewolf. And so began the tale of the demon tailor of Shalon. As the children continued to go missing and sightings of the beast in the woods increased, there was a mass hysteria brewing as people began to lock themselves in their houses to cower in fear of what lay beyond their doors. This fear was only propelled further into the macabre when there began to emerge accounts of seeing the wolfman out in the woods devouring the corpses of children like a ravenous animal. And there were even reports from children returning alive to say that they had been chased by the snarling werewolf. This spurred hunting parties of armed men to go out combing the dark wilderness for the sinister culprit, without success. For a while, it seemed that they were at the mercy of whatever supernatural force had decided to descend upon their once quiet and serene village. But then there would be a dark, new development. There began to be suspicions cast upon the modest shop of a tailor on the outskirts of town, with rumours being that there had been cries heard near the premises, mixed with the fact that the tailor himself was a rather eccentric individual who was rarely seen and had been accused of having an intense interest in the children who passed his store. When reports began to emerge of the tailor speeding off into the woods at all hours of the night, there was a posse gathered to go search his premises. What they would find within those walls was the stuff of nightmares. Beyond the innocent appearance of the shop front was supposedly found a horror show of grotesqueries. In one room was found an array of barrels stashed into a corner, which when opened were found to contain the bones of countless children. In another room it was found to be more like a butcher's shop than a tailor's, with cuts of meat lying out gathering flies, many of them already half eaten, and which proved to be from human beings. The yard was dotted with shallow graves, blood and gore was found everywhere, and it seemed like this was the horrific ghastly layer of a true monster. Yet the tailor himself remained calm and denied that he had done anything wrong at all. The law had other ideas. The man was imprisoned and tortured for a confession to his crimes, which he finally admitted to killing around 50 children, luring them into his shop to slice their throats and then powder and dress their bodies before butchering them and eating them. Oddly, despite him admitting to all of this, he supposedly vehemently denied being a werewolf and brushed off the accusations that he had been transforming into a beast at night to kill children in the forest and ravage their bodies. Nevertheless, there were stories of the man flying into great rages in custody, during which he would throff at the mouth and display feats of superhuman strength, surely only something that a werewolf could do. According to the law of the case, when the tailor of Chalon was brought to trial, there were witnesses who claimed to have seen him actually transform into a wolf, and despite his denials of these charges, the tailor was quickly found guilty and was sentenced to being burned alive. When it came to be his turn in the dock, he allegedly flew into a blasphemous rant and was overcome by another of his animalistic episodes before the sentence was carried out and he was no more, after which the disappearances of children promptly stopped. Apparently, the court then had all of the court records destroyed in order to try and erase the whole event from history, leaving only bits and pieces to survive to this day. 
Indeed, we don't even know what this villain's name was, or what spurred him to carry out these horrific crimes. We also don't know what connection, if any, his case had to the numerous werewolf sightings at the time, and so the tailor of Shalon, or the werewolf of Shalon, remains merely a macabre historical oddity shrouded in mystery until the end of time. The Axeman of New Orleans The Axeman of New Orleans was an American serial killer active in New Orleans, Louisiana and surrounding communities, including Gretna, from May 1918 to October 1919. Press reports during the height of public panic about the killings mentioned similar murders as early as 1911, but recent researchers have called these reports into question. As the killer's epithet implies, the victims were usually attacked with an axe, which often belonged to the victims themselves. In most cases, a panel on a back door of a home was removed by a chisel, which, along with the panel, was left on the floor near the door. The intruder then attacked one or more residents with either an axe or straight razor. The crimes were not motivated by robbery, and the perpetrator never removed items from his victims' homes. The majority of the Axeman's victims were Italian immigrants or Italian-Americans, leading many to believe that the crimes were ethnically motivated. Many media outlets sensationalized this aspect of the crimes, even suggesting mafia involvement despite a lack of evidence. Some crime analysts have suggested that the killings were related to sex, and that the murderer was perhaps a sadist specifically seeking female victims. Criminologists Colin and Damon Wilson hypothesize that the Axeman killed male victims only when they obstructed his attempts to murder women, supported by cases in which the woman of the household was murdered, but not the man. A less plausible theory is that the killer committed the murders in an attempt to promote jazz music, suggested by a letter attributed to the killer in which he stated that he would spare the lives of those who played jazz in their homes. The Axeman was never caught or identified. The murderer's identity still remains unknown to this day, though various possible identifications of varying plausibility have been proposed. On March 13, 1919, a letter purporting to be from the Axeman was published in newspapers. The letter reads as follows. Hell, March 13, 1919. Esteemed model, they have never caught me, and they never will. They have never seen me, for I am invisible, even as the ether that surrounds your earth. I am not a human being, but a spirit, and a demon from the hardest hell. I am what you Orleanians and your foolish police call the Axe Man. When I see fit, I shall come and claim other victims. I alone know whom they shall be. I shall leave no clue except my bloody axe besmeared with blood and brains of he whom I have sent below to keep me company. If you wish, you may tell the police to be careful not to rile me. Of course, I am a reasonable spirit. I take no offense at the way they have conducted their investigations in the past. In fact, they have been so utterly stupid as to not only amuse me, but his satanic majesty, Francis Joseph, etc., but tell them to beware. Let them not try to discover what I am, for it were better that they were never born than to incur the wrath of the Axeman. I do not think there is any need for such warning, for I feel sure the police will always dodge me, as they have in the past. They are wise, and know how to keep away from all harm. Undoubtedly, you Orleanians think of me as a most horrible murderer, which I am but I could be so much worse if I wanted to. If I wished, I could pay a visit to your city every night. At will, I could slay thousands of your best citizens, for I am in close relationship with the Angel of Death. Now, to be exact, at 12.15 Earthly Town, on next Tuesday night, I am going to pass over New Orleans. In my infinite mercy, I am going to make a little proposition to you people. Here it is. I am very fond of jazz music, 
and I swear by all the devils in the nether regions that every person shall be spared in whose home a jazz band is in full swing at the time I have just mentioned. If everyone is a jazz band going, well then, so much the better for you people. One thing is certain, and that is that some of your people who do not jazz it out on that specific Tuesday night, if there be any, will get the axe. Well, as I am cold and crave the warmth of my native Tartarus, and it is about time I leave your earthly home, I will cease my discourse, hoping that thou wilt publish this, that it may go well with thee. I have been, am, and will be the worst spirit that ever existed, either in fact or realm of fantasy. The Axeman On Tuesday, March the 19th, all of New Orleans' dance halls were filled to capacity, and professional and amateur bands played jazz at parties at hundreds of houses around town. There were no murders that night. While we may not know the nature and the person who was the Axeman, we do know his victims. They are Joseph Maggio, Catherine Maggio, Louis Bissuma, Harriet Lowe, Anna Schneider, Joseph Romano, Charles Cortimiglia, Rosie Cortimiglia, Mary Cortimiglia, Steve Boker, Sarah Lawman, and Mike Pepitone. While their killer goes on in secrecy, their names will be remembered for all of eternity. Hi guys, thank you so much for listening to today's video. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you want to hear more true crime, please let me know. Also, if there's a particular case you'd like me to go into in more detail, also let me know about that. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel, hit that notification bell, and leave a like. Doing so really helps out the channel. So, until next time, sleep tight.